Well, I was going to say, I was going to review just a little bit of last week's lesson because it was, I was discussing the, I'll let you know first of all, I can hear me okay, I hope you can hear me over that fan. Hear me okay over that fan? Because I can't, couldn't hardly hear Kathy over that fan. But if you can hear me, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to worry about it. Last week I was talking about the kingdom coming out of Matthew 6, 9 through 13, where thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I was saying that I believe first that that was the prayer of the Lord for himself. We call it the prayer of the Lord, but we mean, we mean it in terms of the Lord gave us this prayer. But in reality, God, Christ owned that prayer. And when he said for them to pray in this manner, he himself had and was praying, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Father, thy kingdom come. And, and then I started speaking in terms of the ages. Uh, we're in an age of mercy and grace. There is an age of, of uh, judgment, a short age, the tribulation period, and then a, a thousand-year millennial age, and then the eternal age beyond that. And the kingdom coming, in the fullest sense, God's kingdom coming, is the eighth day, or that that's out beyond the seventh day, millennial reign of Christ. So you have the kingdom of Christ, the mystery of the kingdom of Christ, which is the millennial reign, and the kingdom ruling, co-ruling by his bride. And then after that, he'll have Christ laying at God's feet, all that has now been put under subjection to him, and then in eternity, then you have the kingdom of God. So that is the kingdom of that the Lord Yeshua was referring to when he said, pray in this manner. And he was relating to that will of, that's done in heaven to come to the earth. And we all know that in the final fullness of that is the new Jerusalem. So I was speaking in those terms of the ages of the kingdom's coming. And I had you turn to Revelations and we read chapter 11. And then there in Revelation, we read that the seventh angel sounded. And we spoke in terms of the sounding of the seventh angel was the seventh trump. And we sometimes think that in terms of that seventh trump being a, a, a note or a blast, and that's it. But that isn't how it's carried in, in the Greek, and, and you can almost see it this way, that when the first angel blew the first trumpet, he kept blowing it. And as the second trumpet was blowing, the first trumpet was still blowing. And the third trumpet was still blowing, the fourth trumpet was still blowing. Those things that related to the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth trumpets were transpiring. Some of them were were in chronological order, some of them weren't. But the seventh trump, when it is blown, is the beginning of the end. <laughs> the, really, the, the, the really rough part of the tribulation It is really the beginning of the reign of the Antichrist on the earth. But that seventh trump co continues through the end of the tribulation with that same sounding that seventh trump present after the fulfilling of the vials, the bowls. The bowls come after the seventh trump. So if you're thinking in terms, well, the seventh trump ushers in Christ's return in the millennial kingdom, you would be thinking wrongly because the seventh trump begins here in the 11th chapter of Revelation and the Vials then don't start until the 15th chapter. So I'm trying to say to you, all I'm trying to say is that in your mind, when you think of the seventh trump, it, it denotes a period of time and events that happen within that period of time. And that period of time runs all the way through the thousand year millennium. The seventh trump, it, it, it relates to that first event as and it relates just as much to the last event which happens at the end of the tr the uh, thousand year millennial period so that's kind of different 
But if you'll search it out uh, and look into it, you'll find that what I'm saying is right. I was saying to you that I think the seventh, seventh trump was the was the one of the keys in that chapter eleven, and then we also had the rod of measurement and the reed of measurement with the measuring and I measuring the temple, the altar, the outer court, and I was suggesting to you that that the temple and the altar is is in heaven, as and and the outer court relates to Jerusalem today and in this end time period that's coming. The outer court is Jerusalem if you stand the tabernacle up on its end and you put the Holy of Holies in heaven and you bring the Holy of Holies down and you bring finally the outer court. Now I'm suggesting to you that, that when John was measuring the, the temple, he was measuring a, an entity in heaven and when he was measuring the altar, it was a heavenly altar. And then when he says, when the Lord said, leave out the outer court because it's given unto the Gentiles, and they used a rod there instead of the reed, that it is that area that we would say the temple should be. But actually, we're in the spiritual realm, it is the outer court because it is for the Gentiles. And in the end times, we know that Jerusalem, as today it is, it is called Egypt. And that it is trodden down by Gentiles. But even more so as the Antichrist takes his full reign. So I was just speaking a little bit in terms last week about the rod of measurement, the temple, the altar, the outer court. And then we were introduced to two witnesses. And we were... We, we spoke in terms of those two witnesses. I think it's reasonable to believe that that's Enoch and Elisha. And then, then the, uh, they're, they're uh, standing up on their feet. They're, they're dying, being killed by the, the one that uh, ascends out of the bottomless pit. Uh, and it's that time at that three and a half years after their three and a half years of service, which we'll call the first part of the tribulation, there at mid-trib then, we have the Antichrist really being revealed. And it is said there in the 11th chapter of Revelation that he ascends up out of the bottomless pit and he kills these two supernatural prophets or witnesses of God they were using supernatural weapons to protect themselves, and it was a supernatural being then that ended their lives. And so it was then that Antichrist was brought on the scene. And that was at the end of three and a half months, but, or three and a half years, but then now we realize that there is three and a half years remaining because that is... After the Antichrist, he rules and reigns for that three and a half year period. I don't know if there was anything else in that, in the 11th chapter that I really want to look at. Uh, there was other things that I had, I had to say about that. Of course, it had to do with the resurrection, Enoch and Elijah, uh, and uh, how they were they are then represented by the man-child. But that's in the 12th chapter. I wanted to say, um, I wanted, wanted to do was last week would like to have gotten into the 12th chapter, 13th and 14th chapter of Revelation, but it's just too much to try to do in a, sh in a short period of time. And, and we still don't have time to do a, a really detailed uh, diving in into the book of Revelation, but what my heart intent would be that at this last six or eight months or however long it is that been that I've been uh, opening up the book uh, to 
to our attention that I would hope that in that period of time and the time that is coming that you grow a, more and more familiar with the book of Revelation. And I did in this lesson, I did a little overview uh, of the first chapter through the 14th chapter. And, uh, and, and I, I, I tried to put the 12th, 13th, and 14th chapter Revelation in this lesson because 12th, 13th, and 14th chapter is interposed or parenthetical between the 11th and the 15th. In other words, the, the 12th, 13th, and 14th chapter reveal what is happening there in the 11th chapter before it, leading up to it, and it speaks again as it relates to the Antichrist as it did in 11, only gives us more detail. It, it's, it declares that now the kingdoms of God uh, and the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. There was great voices saying this when the seventh angel began to blow the trump. And we know that that really isn't fulfilled till the end of the tribulation. Here it is, mid-tribulation, and the, the seventh trump blows and begins to blow. And then now there's this period of three and a half years that needs uh, a, a defining. So, so there in the 11th chapter, we have a, a revelation of Jesus, of, of what is happening at the mid-trib and at the end of the trib. And then the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th chapter, 14th chapter, 12th, 13th, 14th, adds a lot of meat on the bones for that time frame as it relates to how Satan uh, pursues the children of God. It, it, it gives us a clue that he's going to pursue them in that he comes down in rage and that he kills the two witnesses. He come, the Antichrist comes up and the dragon gives him power and he kills those two witnesses. And now, now we understand that the Antichrist is setting his kingdom up upon the earth in conjunction with the false prophet and Satan. And then the 12th, 13th, and 14th chapter gives us the how that happened. And it gives us the how that Satan is going to go about persecuting the children of God, both seeds. And... And then the introduction of the second wild beast that comes out up from below, it, it, the, called the false prophet, it gives us that introduction. So I'm going to, to, to attempt to add some clarity to those things that we talked about last week in the 11th chapter by expounding on the 12th, 13th, 14th chapter of Revelation. Hopefully what I just said made sense to somebody. Made sense to me, but I'm not sure it did to you. Again, I started this, this lesson out in Matthew with Matthew 6, Thy kingdom come, uh, and referred back to that chapter 11 of last week, and I'll call this part 2 of Thy kingdom come with commentary from the book of uh, Revelation. That's where we see in the clearest John revealed to us the clearest, the revelation of the kingdom mystery in the book of Revelation. If it was, if it was nebulous or, or unintelligible or unexplorable, where we couldn't understand it, it wouldn't be called the revelation of Jesus Christ. It, it, it is for us to understand, but it is to be obscured from those that don't have a heart for it. So our prayer humbly, <laughs> humbly is to move forward and to ask God for the truth. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. That, that's, the, that's the heart cry here. It's not to say, look at me or what do I know? Because I can tell you I don't know. Uh, I, I'm grateful for, for God downloading into me mostly by intuitive uh, resonations from the Spirit of God. 
I've been around this block long enough that I had no truth when I hear it. I can wander around the block and hear a lot of chatter, but the truth will stop me in my tracks. So I, I would hope that at least this has the purpose, this expounding has the purpose of my heart and the Spirit of the Lord for us to, under, to kick it in gear, move forward, step out, get to work, watch and pray, as the Lord said, watch and pray. This should inspire us to watch and pray. This, is, this, as I said last week, is as real as it's happened in my life. In my mind, in my heart, this is as real as if it has happened. That's as strong as faith as you can get. If it's as real as to you as if it has happened, that's, that's where it needs to be. And if it's that real, it becomes really important. It, it takes precedence over the things that you see. This is silliness. I, I mean, all the things that the world is about is silliness. And that is the eyes of the spiritual. If we, if we get those eyes, then we're going to lose God. Thank you, God. We're going to lose some contact with the world. It's going, the, your troubles are not going to matter to you in this world. You know, Jeremiah dived in the swimming pool with his phone in his pocket yesterday. Okay. Well, that was very disturbing to him, and it is a disturbing thing. But you know what? In the scheme of things, it's just another care. It's just, hey, I did it. It's, it's done. It's over. Lord, what's the spiritual import here? Or, you know, not, you can't just go into a funk because bad things happen to you. Because they're, they are about refining you. You are in school, and we are being tried and tested so that we can escape that which is coming on the earth. That's the idea here. In case you haven't figured out, God is trying to prepare his children for the rapture. Those that are living at that day when there is a rapture. And we very well could be. We very well could be. So... <clears throat> That's one thing that I know that there's such a separation that I can tell you there's a there is a separation in the in the in the spiritual mindset from the coming of the Lord that should should not take anybody by surprise. How is that going to take anybody by surprise? Think about it. Think about all that's happened now <coughs> up to the time of the Lord coming back. There is not going to be any surprise there for those that are looking for the Lord. But there is a surprise somewhere. There is a surprise where, where, where he, 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 like a thief, comes. And, and, and uh, business is being carried on. And one's on a rooftop and you know, one's at the mill. And there is a, a place where there is a surprise uh, that happens to those, uh, to those in the body of Christ that uh, it's a surprise to the, to the vast majority of those in the body of Christ, but there are, those, there are those that will be prepared for it even though they didn't know it was coming. So I believe that's where the Lord's got us focused. He, that's where he would have us to have as our goal the, the, the rapture. Why? Because we don't know the day or the hour. What I believe Paul was about was Philippians chapter 3 where he said that he wanted to, above all things, to attain unto the first resurrection from among the dead because God had revealed to him that, that he was going to die as he had to Peter. And so there was no looking forward for Paul to the rapture because the Lord had already revealed unto him that he was going to die. And that, that equivalent to the rapture is the first resurrection. So it was to that that he pointed all his heart and attention to be found worthy of the first resurrection as opposed to the rapture. 
Does that make sense to you? That's why I'm teaching about this, because there's a potential that we could, we could be living on the earth when the rapture happens. The catching up. The man-child, if you will. That's what we're going to talk about, the man-child. The first uh, three chapters of Revelation, uh, you, you all know this, there are exhortations to Christians to unleaven in character. What for? For the inheritance into the kingdom coming. The millennial reign of Christ and His bride. What constitutes victory or defeat is shown in these seven letters. What constitutes our being found worthy or unworthy is found in these seven letters. Of course, it's augmented through the rest of the New Covenant and Old, but, but it's clear that if you, if you study these three chapters of Revelation, you should be able to locate yourself in there. And you should, and you should be able to find the, th the wiles of the devil and find the things that you are easily beset in and that you should work and can work on those things so that you might qualify for an overcomer. The question is, <clears throat> are we a serious student of the will of Christ? We can test our own hearts against His words to the churches to see where we stand, to see if we are prepared for His return and what the wiles of Satan we are in need to resist if we intend to conquer and be His overcomers. Do you care? Do you care or do you think it's just covered? Does it matter? The fourth chapter begins with, that's the first three chapters, and the fourth chapter begins with John being caught up and shown things which must be hereafter. Hereafter being later than, than his time. The first thing he's seeing is the setting up of a throne that's not now set up. If you look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, you'll find, and I look and beheld, and the door was opened, and the first voice was heard was there was a trumpet talking with me, and was said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And then the second, it says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. This, this is actually, was being set, is the Greek. There's a throne that was being set in heaven, and one set on the throne. It is the future throne of judgment. The days of mercy and grace now ending with the end of the third chapter of Revelation, the letters to the churches. Now in the fourth chapter we have another hereafter that was seen by John that was a throne being set up, which is a throne that we've spoke about in times past that only the Lamb was worthy to judge, and he was given the seven-sealed book, and he began to unseal the book. That was the beginnings of the days of judgment, the last days, the tribulation period, or at least it was the beginning of those birth pains, those sorrows that he spoke of in Matthew one or the other, and he was the one worthy to open those seals, and therefore the days of mercy and grace or the gospel of the mercy and grace that was relative to the churches was ending, and the days of judgment and recompense and revenge, the blood revenge, were setting in. Heavenly angels of God yielded up their authority willingly. You remember the elders cast their 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 uh, crowns of authority before the Lord, giving them up willingly and praising Him for His worthiness. And then chapter five reveals the Lamb as the only worthy 
to sit upon the throne of judgment and to open the seven seals of judgment beginning the tribulation period or Jacob's trouble. Then the close of chapter 5 anticipates the final outcome of the intervention of the Lamb, the subjection of the entire universe in the kingdom of God, as does the remainder of the book, the rest of the chapters through 22, proceeds to show the different events and stages which will reach that outcome. So the book of Revelation is about the kingdom coming, the kingdom of God coming. And the first three chapters are preparatory to the church. The fourth, fifth chapters are revealing to us of that that transpires in heaven or in the heavens, not, not, as, not in heaven per se, the third heaven, but in my mind, many of these events are happening in the first heaven. Potentially, I've draw, I brought drawings years ago that are elaborate. <laughs> I still got them, by the way, that show the different, uh, the different levels uh, of heaven. So you have you know, the third heaven. Where, where God is. And then you have the second heaven that we know very little about or told very little. And then we have the first heaven. And this first heaven is where the war that I'm going to speak about in a minute is transpiring. There's the earth. So he, the fifth chapter gives us an overview and reminds us of the subject that the entire universe is to be put into the hands of, of God. Chapter 6, the Lamb begins to open the seals. And we, have, we know we have the seals, we have the trumpets, we have the vials. In there, in there we have woes and thunders, and but those those three sets of seven comprise the actual beginning and the ending of this tribulation period. And here the Lamb begins with the opening of the seals that will encompass much of that period known as the tribulation and great day of His wrath. Just like those trumpets keep, can keep on blowing, it's still the time of the seventh trump three and a half years later, those seals, though they be broken, and that those events or a event that that seal might represent may continue throughout the entire seven-year period. It doesn't come, happen, stop, next seal. Come, happen, stop, next seal. It is a opening, and it's an exponential uh, worsening, but the first don't stop just because the second's opened, and the third isn't stopped just because the fifth is open. Or so there are some events in there that happen once in a in a moment of time or a short time, and then dissipate or go away. But we need to get in our mind that that the actual revealing of the truth is that it it's it's overlaid. It's not like Egypt when the plagues were busted out. It was an event. It happened. It was over with. The event, it happened. It was over with. This is three times seven. It's 21, uh, 21 plagues just right there. And there are, many of them are overlapping the others. Maybe I'm beating that too much, but I, I, just, I think that it's important that we understand that. So the chapter 6 shows where the Lamb begins to open the seals. Chapter 7, the sealing of the serpents of our God in their foreheads numbered... What did I say? Serpents? Chapter 7, the sealing of the servants of our God in their foreheads numbered at 144,000. Total 12,000 from 12 tribes of Israel, their faithful witnesses during the tribulation. 
in verse 9, after this, in other words, after the sealing of this 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe, after this it says, verse 9, and then I wrote there for your consideration, this is after a good while. After this, after the sealing of the 12,000 from every tribe, the 144,000, a good while transpires, and John beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb. And one of the elders saying unto me, What are you these, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence they came? And I said, John said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. So you can see that, that after this, after the sealing of those 144,000, there was a time that transpired. The time that transpired was completely through the tribulation. So the rest of that chapter 7, after this, relates to the end of the tribulation where the sealing of those 12 from every tribe was during the tribulation. Are you with me? That's also, in my mind, important in getting a, at least the conceptual idea of the book of Revelation. I know that once you have the concept, once I have the concept, I can connect the dots. I, I, I understand, once I understand something, I, then I can see how the word of God unfolds in it. But as long as it just stays all foggy, we're not going to be able to connect the dots. But that's one key of understanding that after this it means a good while because of the event that he saw after the sealing was at the end of the tribulation according to the word of God these are they which came out of the great tribulation so what he saw was those that had made it through the tribulation and who were they how many were there they were innumerable <laughs> there's a lot and 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 if you and if we if we discerned correctly, it was not only all the martyrs that came out through the tribulation, but it was also those that were a part of the harvest of the first resurrection, which made it innumerable. Those are the dead. The dead and those that had been living that endured. I, and I'll spl explain that a little bit more. Chapter 8, the seventh seal is opened and the seven trumpets are introduced and begin to be sounded. For having been sounded, then a vulture flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which were yet to be sounded. So the first four trumpets were sounded and now this vulture flies across the sky and says, Woe, woe, woe which is he, he ties equivalent to the last three trumpets. But they were considerably weightier than the first four. So the significance of the whoa, whoa, whoa. Chapter 9, two of those three remaining trumpets sounded. They sound. I, should, I say sound and I didn't use ED on that because then that gives it past tense but I don't mean it to be past tense. Two of the three remaining trumpets sound and judgments are executed and many die, but the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, neither repented they of their murderers, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. The point being that they had, had seals, Six seals, and then the seventh seal was open. Sit. Then the first trump, second trump, third trump, fourth trump, two of the woe woes, and still these that were on the earth, these people that are on the earth would not repent of their fornications, of their thefts, and all the rest of it. Why? Well, God didn't intend for them to repent. Or let me put it this way. 
The intent of the plagues is not repentance, even though it will cause some. The intent of the, of the plagues is punitive. This is punishment. This is coming about because of the day of judgments are here. That, that Christ sitting on the throne of judgment now has at the very least slowed that time of grace and mercy and mercy down to where it effectively th that gospel is 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 unaffected unaffective and no more sounded why we're going to find out why well there's a lot of pressures being brought to bear on the earth at this time now the, and 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 then a good portion of those that were the salt and the light are now gone the point being there in the ninth chapter is after all of this, out of all these plagues, still the men on the earth, they didn't repent of the works of their hands. That to me is significant. Chapter 10, a mighty angel comes down from heaven with a little book, setting his right foot upon the sea and his left on the earth and cried with a loud voice. And when he cried... Seven thunders uttered their voice. John was told not to write what the thunders spoke. Now the angel declares there will be no more deference of time. You know, we found out through this time that God, God defers judgment. He's deferred it, he's deferred it, he's, he's, he's held off. But now we find in this 10th chapter that there is no more. It's finished. It says, the voice of the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants and the prophets the mystery of the kingdom of God coming. So here we have the, the period that I'm really focusing in on is at the end of chapter 11, beginning of chapter 12. I'm focusing in on this time when God says he'll defer no more judgment. I'm focusing in on this time when the seventh trump has been sounded where the, those in heaven exclaim and praise God with a loud voice and again throw their crowns on the, at the feet of the Lord and throw themselves on their faces before the Lord. This time is that they now begin to see the mysteries of the kingdom of God fully. Listen, the angels of heaven don't know God's kingdom understanding. They have a perspective, but that, that God has hidden in his own counsel. And, he, and this isn't orchestrated. Okay, when I count to three, all you angels jump up and shout and throw your crowns down and get on your faces, okay? One, two, three. Woo! That's not what's happening. What's happening is that is enthusiasm for, for their God that now they, having had all the history uh, going all the way back to Satan's fall and before, they have all the history of God restoring the kingdom unto himself and how he's going to do it and the wonders of it all in the face of the opposition which is mighty. What he's done. Wow! That's worthy of me falling on my face. That's what's happening here. 
And when they see this, they exclaim, all the mysteries of God, the mysteries of God, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. They see it now. They see it clear. It's not vague anymore to them. It's not. I think it's Ephesians 3.10 that says that that God intends to reveal the mysteries of heaven, the, these things that the angels long to look into through, through us. That's what's happened right here. Right here in this chapter. Right here as we are beginning to, to explore the second half of the tribulation. Now, no more deference. Now the seventh trump's blown. Everything is going to be fulfilled. The seventh trump's blown. He's not going to stop it. He's not going to stop the trump somewhere and say, well, let's, go, let's defer this 2,000 more years. That isn't, he's given us his word. Once that blows, that's it. No more deference. All my judgment will be poured out, and I'll bring to pass everything like I said I was going to do. Wow, that's worthy to praise you, God. Before now... You were subject to change. But now I know you're not going to change. I'm going to worship you. For I see now you are going to be restored all the kingdom. So this mystery of the kingdom of God coming. Roman, I, I just gave a few scriptures and I intend... You know, not everybody downloads the notes, but I would encourage anybody that uh, is listening that it's worthy to download the notes and, and take the notes because the notes have all the Scripture references that I'm not just spinning a story uh, out of my imagination. Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which is, was kept secret since the world began. See, and now in the verse 26 is what's happening. What is happening here in Revelation, the end of the chapter 11 and the beginning of 12? What's happening? But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And then Matthew 13, 11 is the mystery of the kingdom of heaven and Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, which refers to the Lord, right? And I think this is important scripture to read because of something I think I remember I wrote <clears throat> later on in this lesson. I think I make a reference to, not specifically to this scripture, but I allude to it. There's an allusion to it. God who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in the past unto the fathers by the prophets. We know that to be so. We have the Torah, we have the prophets, and we have the psalm. Verse 2, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the ages. That word worlds there is actually ages. Chapter 11. That was kind of chapter 10. And chapter 11, which is the chapter that we looked at last week, I, I listed out, oh, I don't know, four, four or more things that are points in that chapter. One was the measuring of the temple and the altar and them that worship therein. Them that worship therein have to be in heaven because there is no temple on the earth. And even if there was, it wouldn't be acceptable worship unto the Father. Along with the instruction to leave the outer court, for it was given unto the Gentiles for 42 months. Three and a half years. Number two in chapter 11, the two witnesses are given power and prophesy for the same period of time after which the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall war with them and overcome and kill them. And then after three and a half days, life enters them, the two witnesses, and they stand up and a great voice saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies beheld them. 
In that self same hour was an earthquake, and a portion of the city of Jerusalem is destroyed with thousands slain. The third point in chapter 11 was the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Then the fourth point, the seventh angel begins sounding the seventh trumpet. And we, we, we like the word here, says that the third woe and the seventh trumpet are one the same. We may conclude that each of the preceding six angels will continue blowing throughout the seventh trumpet, blowing until that mystery of God will reach its conclusion. With voices in heaven seeing now the events unfolding and its conclusion being the resurrection and the judging of the dead, faith, falling upon their faces, worshiping and saying, the kingdoms of the world are to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It is here that the seven last plagues or vials begin, which is the third woe, corresponding in time with Revelation 15, 7, 16 through 121. All I'm saying there is, is that chapters 12, 13, or 14 are interposed, are parenthetical, explaining all those things that are before and some after so, so in more detail. And it is in, at the uh, sounding of the seventh trump, the third woe, that we have the beginning of the pouring out of the seven vials. But there's this parenthetical insertion here, the 12th chapter, 13th chapter, and the 14th, before it actually says, and the first angel poured out the first vial. So we have, we have some detail that we can look at to explain up to where we are before we go to see what those vials are. That now we get to the 12th chapter, which is really the focus of what I wanted to talk to you about. The 12th chapter of Revelation, along with the 13th and the 14th chapters, is parenthetical between the 11th and 15th chapters. In other words, the 12th, 13th, and 14th describe in more detail the events leading up to it and what has happened in chapter 11. Chapter 12 Satan is still acting in the first heaven. Well, that may not mean anything to most if you didn't understand that Satan doesn't remain acting in the heaven. What heaven? Up here in this heaven? No, Jesus saw him in Luke 10. Like lightning fell. No, he... He was judged, he was removed, he's gone from the third heaven, he was cast down to the first heaven. It is here that Satan, right now today, in the form of a serpent or, or more in line with a dragon, for the dragon has, has a presence in heaven and on the earth. It is here in the opening of the 12th chapter of Revelation that we find the serpent or Satan having uh, action, presence, working, using that heaven as his platform to operate out of. He is the power of the air. The Lord three times alluded to him as that. He's a God of this world. So it's important to note that when the 12th chapter opens up, Satan is still acting in the first heaven. The beast has not yet been brought up on the scene. And when I say brought up on the scene, it, I, I believe it's literal in the 11th chapter where he is brought up from where? From Hades. He, the Antichrist, is brought out of the bottomless pit, out of Hades, is brought up to the earth in conjunction by the hand of Satan, the dragon. That's what the word says. A lot, there's a lot of people that have said a lot of other things, but 
seek it out. Let's give the word credence. And any time that it can literally be interpreted, let's interpret it. If it's irrational to interpret the word in a, in a practical, real way, then we can apply some of those other types of spiritualizing spins. But to say that the, the Antichrist ascended out of the bottomless pit is not hard to find historic, spir uh, spiritual and scriptural history with that actually happening. One in our Lord. Another Samuel with the witch Endor. I, I can go on and on with examples. That, that's why it's not hard for me to take Revelation chapter 11 literally when it says the Antichrist ascends out of the bottomless pit. Because we're all believing that there is an angel that does come up out of that, Abaddon, Abaddon. So, so let's literally say that's a fact. Let, it's going to happen. He's going to come up. And, and, and he hadn't come up yet at the beginning of the 12th chapter. And Satan is still operating in heaven, in that heavenly realm. And there appeared a great sign in heaven. I'm in 12th chapter of Hebrews. Let's just go there so you'll have it open before you. My Bible has actually <clears throat> is actually separated at the 12th chapter of Revelation. All I have to do is pull this portion out because it <laughs> It's right on the 12th chapter. This Bible is not long for this earth. This was my father-in-law's Bible. I hate to give it up, but it's about to give, give up. His daughter wants to save it, so I can't take it any further. So the 12th chapter of Revelation says, And there appeared a great wonder, and that word wonder there, actually, if you look probably in your Bible, it shows that that word should be signed. So there's this great sign in heaven. A woman, and she being with child, cried, travailing in birth. So the scenes that are now following this are called signs because they refer back to the mystery of God. Signs. Give us a sign. If you really let me see something, do something. Give us a sign. Here's your sign. Here's our sign. Here's our new covenant sign. Here's the old covenant sign. Here's the sign. The scenes now following are called signs because they refer back to the mystery of God hidden in the Torah, the old covenant prophets, now being revealed in Jesus Christ's revelation to his church. How so? How is this a sign tying the Old Covenant to the New Covenant? Well, the woman obviously has significance in the Old Covenant. The serpent has significance in the Old Covenant. The, the, 12, uh, uh, the 12 emblems or uh, crowns uh, uh, overhead. The moon below her feet. Uh, the sun adorning her, uh, the stars, all of these signs are types that are already found in the Old Covenant. And it's by the f law of first mention that we can determine God's Word. Whenever God mentions it, the first time He ever mentions it, that's the way it is and that's the way it will remain through the Bible. He doesn't change he doesn't switch it around. The laws of first mention are available for us to live. What's the first mention of the serpent? What's the first mention of the woman? Where, 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 can, where do we have to go to find the first mention of any of these signs that we're seeing in Revelation 12? 
If you want to find out what that means, Revelation 12, the woman, go back to the signs in the Old Covenant. That, that is where you go. You let the Word interpret the Word. You don't try to spin something because you have an ideology or a philosophy or some kind of theology and you try to make it fit, which is what has happened. That's why we have such a mixed bag of interpretations of the Word of God as it relates to Revelation. So, so let's just take it here. You, you judge. Certainly don't think that I've got it all. I think you all have capability to discern this. In type, then, Jesus is the second Adam. The woman is the body of Christ. Wow. Let me just let that catch up with you. In type, in type, Jesus is the second Adam. And in type, this woman that we're looking at here, think about it. is the body of Christ. This eternal body is being formed by the saved. The, the eternal body is being formed by the saved. There, there's a corporate body, and then there's a body. Mike Balloon is in the body corporate of Christ. How did I get there? And what is it? Well, I am a part of that woman who will bring forth seed. And Adam is the first man. Christ is the second Adam. And corporately, this woman that we're seeing here in the first few verses of chapter 12 is the body of Christ corporate. You're in it. Me. I'm in it. Why? Because we're born again. That's how you got into the body of Christ. You were born again. This eternal body, and it is eternal, it's not going to die again. This eternal body being formed by the saved, saved means redeemed. Since the garden fall. See, the blood that redeemed Adam and Eve was representative of whose blood? Okay, so... So they weren't born into the body of a, of a goat or sheep or whatever. They were born into this corporate body called the second woman. The woman espoused to the second Adam. Now, you're not going to hear this every day, people. And so you may have a little hard time there with it. But chew on it because that's, that's really what's happening here. And that's what we're, be, we're seeing. We're, and why well, I know we're seeing that, I'll show you in a minute through, its, through her children. But that's what we're looking at here. She represents corporately the body of Jesus Christ. Since the garden fall. Not, not since his death, resurrection, ascension, coronation, and then you accepting him. Those that died before Christ ever was manifest are still in that body. They're redeemed. The redeemed are in that body. Some of them are more noble than others, but isn't that what we're told? This eternal body being formed by the Savior, redeemed since the Garden Fall. He has now begun to bringing many Overcoming is the word I added. Sons unto glory. What's Christ doing? Through His body, He's bringing many sons unto go glory to God. That's Hebrews 2.10, Revelations 1, 2, and 3. That's his, that's his exhortation to the church was, let's be sons of God. 
And if you aren't doing this, you will not be the sons of God. If you are doing this, you will be the sons of God. Christ owns the sin of His body. And He exhorts those within it. Exhorts is warning and encouraging at the same time. And warning with a threat and encouraging with a promise. What do you think the first three books of Revelation are about? This heavenly sign has the enmity in full view from the curse of the garden between the woman and the serpent. In other words, when God cursed the man, the woman, the ground, Satan, and he put enmity between the woman and the serpent, he had in full view this vision now that John is seeing and the fullness, the manifestation of it. Can you see that? This woman is at enmity. We're going to find out how much at an enmity she is with Satan in just a few verses. But, but right now we need to acknowledge that this woman is at enmity with Satan and it started in the garden. It started in the garden and Christ, God's saying that, that you, Satan will bruise his heel, what? Bruise the seed of the woman's heel, which he did figuratively and literally. Figuratively, he is in us, and figuratively he did with Christ, but literally he also when he was nailed to the cross. But it says that her seed, this woman's seed, would crush his head. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for telling us the things at the end from the very beginning. Praise His holy name that you can take the Word of God and you can see what it is that He's saying by simply understanding His Word. Now this woman is pregnant. She is more than just pregnant. She is travailing. It's happening right now. And that foretells to the seed, it tells the sa to Satan, that, that that seed that's going to crush his head is about to break on the scene. Now he's still operating in the heavenly realm when he sees this, this happening or approaching. What gave him his first clue? I suppose what gave him the first clue was when Christ the Lamb was set up on a new throne of judgment. I would su suggest to you that he... He saw that and that he begun to, to discern the, the times by what Christ was doing, coming out from the Father's throne and coming to sit on a judgment seat. Where is now this pregnant seed of the woman? Where is she? Where is he? It's a man child. Where is he? He's on the earth. He's on the earth. <laughs> I, I, this, this is this is me, okay? I I I I, I don't know. I, I have I have scripture and I can show you and I will show you the scriptures, but this is how I think that it's playing. I, I'm, I'm subject to change my mind with the Lord giving me more revelation, but I just for the picture that you and I be on the same page, let's just say that that throne of judgment was being set up right there. Okay, If the throne was set up here, and this lamb, I always draw a lamb looks like a puppy, this lamb and the seals are being broken, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There, there's a clue here, right? There's a clue to the Satan, the serpent, who's at enmity with the woman, that, that he is going to bring forth this man-child 
this man-child which is going to be caught up from the earth. Out of the body comes the man-child. Out of what body? Out of the body corporate that is live on the earth at the time that he sets up his throne. Who? Out of the body of those that are alive on the earth at the time that he sets up his throne, breaks the seals, and says to the Father, they are ripe for harvest. Not the bodies lying in the grave or in Hades. Not any of those bodies. Not all the church corporate alive on the earth, but those that are found awake and alert and worthy. That's the man-child. That's the child this woman is going to give birth to. The identity of this is clear from the law first mentioned in the promise to the overcomers of the carnal nature, Revelations 2.26. What does it say? Revelations 2.26 says, And that he that overcometh and keeps the works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received from my Father. So we, we know that these are those that are re referred or related to us in the third chapter, or the second chapter of Revelation, verse 226. These are the overcomers of the carnal nature. Those that were born again, they are also known as the bride. I like to say the bride informing. They're a bride dynamic. They're a bride, part of the bride. Genesis 24, 65. Can we just read a few of these scriptures? so you can get the feel of the message. Genesis chapter 24, 65 says, for she, for she has said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant has said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her and Isaac was confronted or comforted with his, from his mother's death. I'm suggesting to you that this story of the man-child coming forth is the first fruits offering of the bride of Christ being caught up to him in this realm. Then Revelations 19, 7 and 8, you remember those scriptures, right? She has made herself worthy. She, she has been arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And then Luke 21, 36 you ought to have that memorized by now. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape 
all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. All these things that shall come to pass are the tribulation plagues. And then Revelations, I think I gave this scripture, didn't I? Yeah, Revelations 3.10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Here's where I've gotten a lot of flack in years past from people who have thought I have stolen away the promises of, of God as it relates to the rapture. I haven't stolen them away. I've only qualified them. I've excluded those that haven't been aren't a part of the bride, who haven't been watchful, haven't cared, and weren't found worthy. I've excluded those, but I have included in a rapture that the Lord has promised for those that, that are ripe. They need not go through the tribulation. They are the first fruits offering. You know the first fruits offering? Do we have time to talk about the first fruits offering? That in itself is an hour long message. But the first fruits are those fruits that they gather husk by husk, out of, or sheave by sheave, out of the field that have already whitened prior in the, in the early summer before the rest of the harvest. That's what's represented here in the man child. It's the first fruits. The first fruits are those in the sheave that have ripened under the conditions that were already there before the long, hot summer. In other words, they didn't need more than what the, the Lord gave them in word and commandment to, to ripen. They didn't need that, that additional uh, persecution and affliction of, of the tribulation to become ripe. They became ripe because they willed in, of their own will. I always said there's two ways to go, go with God, my way and the highway, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's by force or by will, by, by your free will. Uh, you, you, don't, you can always stiffen your neck and it can snap. Now, I'm not saying that you, can, you can't resist God, but you'll resist Him to the point where your neck will snap. He, he, will, he will woo you. He will exhort you. Then He will punish you to, 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 to not for punitiveness, but exhortation kind of punishment to change you into the character that he desires, he will, he will bring in about in your circumstances those things that are very unpleasant to you. Uh, thank God for those things. I would, as Scott has prayed, you know, shake us, God, shake us to the core. I'm, I'm all about that. If I can't, if I won't, if I won't by my own will, then discipline me, shaking me. Because I want to ripen. I want to, to, I want to be harvested. And I, I, I would like to be a part of the first harvest, which means that I have yielded my will before it got really, really tough. And there's more merit in that too, isn't there? So, she is the second Eve. This woman is the second Eve. She's, she's formed and taken out of the body, then living. <laughs> For the man-child is born out of travail as this age nears its end. It is not the martyrs or faithful from earlier times, they will rise in the first resurrection and will also rule with Christ. There's no, there's no hint of a resurrection here in the 12th chapter of Revelation. There's a catching up, but there's no hint of a resurrection from the dead. So why would we, why we interject it? We won't interject it. Or what we will suggest is that there is no resurrection, even though there are worthies who have died and now have their place in the place of comfort in Hades, but they await the first resurrection. 
because this man-child is only made up of the living, faithful, worthy watching, not of those past worthies who have died and find themselves in the place of Hades, in the place of comfort, awaiting the first resurrection. This is independent. It is for the purpose of saving those that have already ripened from going through something that was intended to ripen, that that remained. So now, they will rise in the first resurrection and they will rule and reign with Christ just as this first fruits. The harvest will, the harvest is a part of the first fruits. The first fruits is a part of the harvest. The man child is an alive and awake group of overcomers at the time here appointed who are caught up alive to the throne set above. There is no allusion to a resurrection that accompanies the man-child catching away. It is only living saints, thus it is not the event of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, and it's not the event of 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. Although it can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's in that order of every man being resurrected in his order. It or caught up in his order. But it is not that twinkling of an eye changing. It is not the First Thessalonians chapter 4. 4. It is a, an event that precedes it without Christ coming to the earth or into it, into the very atmosphere of the earth. This is a calling up, not a coming down. The second coming is a coming down. This one, this is simply a catching up. Kathy? Well, you're, you're spot on. You're on your spot on because it is Enoch and Elisha that are manifest as the two witnesses that are killed by the Antichrist that are then resurrected and then they ascend up above. Where do they ascend to? They join these of the first fruits. The, these, Enoch and Elijah, and these have the same kind of heart, and they pleased God. And, and he, he walked no more because he pleased God. So that you're exactly right. It's that same spirit. It's actually the same exact place that they both attend after it, when, they, when the Spirit of the Lord raises up those two on their feet and then says, come up, ascend above, that's where they go. They don't go to the third heaven. They go to here where Christ is. That, that, those events of 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 17 and 1 Corinthians 15 are very near to, that, to this event, to the man-child, but they're separate events. War in the heavenly realm now ensues as the dragon resists the establishment of this new authority there. War ensues. Isn't that what we have here in the 12th chapter? Verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That's what I said by the law first mentioned. If you go back to Revelation chapter 2, you find that this, these are overcomers that are a part of the man-child. That's the same exact promise that you'll find in Revelation 2, the overcomers. And here these are caught up to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and, his, and to his throne. 
And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared. Verse 7, and there was a war in heaven. So now this war ensues, and the war is over the first fruits. The war is over these that are being birthed out of the corporate woman, the body of Christ, that is giving forth this firstborn man-child that is found worthy to ascend unto Christ in His throne in the realm wherein Satan now rules and reigns from. It is the dynamic that when these are being caught up that Satan, a war ensues in heaven and what he couldn't do by stealth, he now tries to do by force. So the war, the war is about authority. The war is a result of Christ coming out from the throne of God in heaven to establish His God-given throne and to receive unto Himself that which is by His right of victory. The advocate takes His victorious position and calls forth His living bride. The serpent with wiles presses His legal position with God as the accuser of the brethren. The hinderer. In resistance against the ascending child. Having lost then on legal ground, he is now, he now as the red dragon resists in spiritual combat with Michael. In other words, he, he, at, he attempts to resist this birth and the changing of the authority in this realm through a legal documents, legal arguments as a heat, as the hinderer and as the accuser, but failing in that, now he fights physically in the spirit. He fights to maintain that which he has had hold of for these however millenniums. And Michael, the same Michael that stood up in Daniel for Israel, this Michael, which I write here, I suggest to you, the meaning of Michael is he who is as God. It's Michael and his angels. Isn't that interesting? The wording. Michael and his angels. And the word Michael means he who is as God. And if, if I'm not mistaken, is Jesus as the angel of the Lord. In other words, to the angels, Christ is Michael. To, the, to human beings, he is Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God. And to those who would argue something about archangels, I have looked and there's only a reference to one archangel, and that's Michael. So, you know, I've heard lists of nine and so forth. I, I'm just going to make a suggestion to you that Michael in the Old Covenant was the Lord, the, the, the angel of the Lord, and he is the angel of the Lord here. He's the one that does battle with, with Satan, the serpent, in this heavenly realm with his angels. For he is Lord of all the angels, and he's known as like as God, as, as opposed to Jesus, the Lamb. For, you, for those of you that make sense, if I have no problem one way or another. These are those who will take from him and his fallen angels their abode and heavenly kingdom over the nations of the earth. It is in type like unto the giants, King Sion and Og. You remember how they come out to resist and battle. You know who they were. They were giants, right? They were supernatural. They were, they were of the seed of an angelic force, the fallen angels. And they were giants. They were a supernatural force, in other words. They, Zion and Og, came out to resist the Israelites from their inheritance. Think about it. Think about it. I've always said to you that, that the, the land of Canaan, the promised land, is not representative of heaven 
it's representative of the heavenlies. This place right here. This is our promised inheritance during the millennial reign. And it is here that we face Zion and Og. Same dynamic. You want to inherit this realm, this heavenly realm to rule and reign from with Christ? You've got to overcome Zion and Og. How do you overcome them? First three chapters of Revelation. Yes. That's what I say. How, you, how do you defeat Zion and Og? The carnal nature. That goes back to the spirit, soul, and body. That goes back to how you introduce to, to people this battle on an individual basis as opposed to a corporate basis. Zion and Og. You have to defeat them. That's right. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. As a matter of fact, we are to take no thought for a suffered wrong. Walk an extra mile. Turn the other cheek. We're not to wrestle with flesh at all. We're not to take our brother to court. Uh, we're to forgive uh, even our enemies and pray for them. But in a spiritual realm, it's a whole nother deal. It's a whole nother battle. And to do the things of, that Christ instructs us to do in the kingdom of heaven is more difficult than taking up arms and fighting on a physical level. It is a spiritual battle that you, we need to pray for that ability. It isn't a natural ability. It's an unnatural ability that we acquire by the power of the Holy Spirit as we yield to Him. It's unnatural. It's unnatural to turn the other cheek. You know, we say that we will, but when it actually somebody slaps us, it's actually not our first impulse. So it, it, it is this battle that we are fighting that we might be found worthy to be caught up if we are alive in that, in that rapture. In or be birthed as the man child is the way that scriptures here portray it. Now, I want to be a part of the man child. Um, I want to go on record as saying I want to be a part. And whatever that takes, that's what I want. And I set my heart to obtain unto that. So we find this war going on, Michael and his angels fight with the devil and his angels uh, and, they, and they, they, take, they take from him. They take from the serpent, from, from the dragon and his fallen angels, their abode and heavenly kingdom. They take it away from him. And, and what does it say here in the uh, ninth verse of 12th chapter? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The battle ensued because of the, the birth that was coming from the woman, the man-child. The battle ensued because of that, and Christ and his angels withstood Satan in that heavenly realm, Maybe by the prayers of the saints. Who knows what forces are brought to bear. But in any case, he accomplishes the purpose of establishing his base, his throne in that heavenly realm and removing from there the devil and his angels. And that's why they rejoice in heaven, but they cry, woe, woe, woe on the earth. For the devil has come down to them. That's the dynamic. That's the transition. And now, suddenly, we have a time here when the Antichrist comes forth. After this casting down of the red dragon, the serpent. Having brought forth the first fruits of the bride out of his body, out of the body, 
1 Corinthians 15, 23. That is those faithful who have answered the heavenly call, Hebrews 3, 1, to be joined at the first resurrection by the faithful out of all dispensations, Matthew 8, 11, Hebrews 11, 16, into the heavenly realm, Eden is restored. I'm just letting the word, the word, uh, interpret the word. So we found first mention woman, we found first mention uh, serpent, we found first mention Eden. I'm just suggesting to you that we can go back to the very first chapters of the book of Genesis and we can find this, th what this detail describes before us. And what I finally say there, as it at the end of that war, and as the man-child is caught up to be with Christ at the throne, I'm suggesting to you that in a form, Eden is restored. Now, this heavenly place here becomes in type Eden. Okay? But Eden, like this very place right here, is still transitory, it is not eternal, and it this this will all be destroyed and made new. But for the, for the moment, a thousand year moment, in time, Eden is being restored in the first heaven. That's where we're, that's where we're, that's our destiny for the next thousand years is to be transplanted into this place in Eden, in a garden of God. Yes, thank you. That's right. It, it is the purpose of God being played out in Adam and Eve again. Out of second Adam and the second Eve, now rule and reign over all, take dominion over all the earth and heaven. And not kind of in a state of mercy and grace, but in a state of a judgment, a ruling with a rod of iron. It's a whole different now new dynamic. Why? Because there are those that are left that are still very much, I say very much, to a degree still aligned with Satan. The earth is still populated with a lot of people that have had a great impression upon them from Satan and the fallen nature. So this age that, the, that these elect worthies like unto Christ are ruling over this planet is in the age of judgment. It's an age of justice. It will be, be ruled over with a rod of iron up until that last short season before the end of that millennial period. The woman having other children is now seen upon the earth fleeing to the wilderness. See, the woman gives birth, but here in the 12th chapter we find that she now, the woman, is found to be on earth. That's, that's corporate, see? That's, that's the body of Christ corporate. That part of the body of Christ living that was heavenly minded and their, their kingdom was not of this earth, that part of the seed is caught up. But the remainder of the seed, which is represented in the woman, now must flee into the wilderness. So now you have this dynamic, birth given, but now Satan has been replaced and cast out, but he turns now, he couldn't destroy the man-child, that that was caught up in the heaven, and he lost his very place there because of him. Well, he's not going to lose his place on earth because of this seed, I'm going to track them down and kill every one of them. And I can't do it, you know, as I once could from this heavenly realm, but I can do it with corporately through my own kingdom and setting up and bringing to pass dead men again supernaturally to rule and reign in my kingdom on the earth. First order of business, Kill the seed of the woman. 
The what? The faithful seed. For it's the faithful seed that Matthew says to flee out of the hills of Judea, out of Jerusalem, flee into the wilderness. It's the faithful. And the faithful heard and listened and saw something that Christ had warned them about when you see this happening. Flee. They did flee. That's what we see here in the 12th chapter of Revelation with the remainder of the seed that wasn't a part of the man-child. They flee into the wilderness and Satan pursues them. The red dragon goes after them. Luke 21, 20 and 21 is the scripture verse that I use for this other child. See, see, the woman has two children. It has the earthly and it has the heavenly. And now we went from the heavenly to the earthly children. And so Luke 21, now having in chapter 12, the heavenly rescued, taken out, kept safe. Now we have the Lord turning His interest toward that other seed. Luke 21, 20, 21. And when you see, you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein. Listen, you should be having the understanding that the middle of the trib is now being made manifest wherein the Antichrist is now being exposed as what he is and that he is now trying to set up his throne in Jerusalem and he now kills the two witnesses. These are all the signs to the to the seed of the woman, the other true seed of the woman, to escape out of Jerusalem. Because shortly, shortly with the destruction of the two witnesses, there comes the earthquake that kills thousands of people in Jerusalem. Did you raise your hand? I'm talking to the hundred, about the 144,000. I'm talking about the two witnesses, and I'm talking about those that keep the commandments of God. Keeping the commandments of God, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So the woman had another seed besides the man-child seed, and that seed is made up of two entities. Those that keep the commandments of God, those that are faithful to Yahweh, those who are of the 144,000 that are proselyting the faithful of the Yahweh, and you have those that give testimony of Jesus Christ. You have those that remain from the seed that were found unworthy of the man-child birth. That seed. God forbid that it be any of us. My prayer is always that we be found to be worthy for the man-child or for the first resurrection. But there is a seed. This is, what, this is how you answer the question uh, uh, scripturally. Do all get caught up at the rapture? No. But some do get caught up as proven in these scriptures. But those that are not found worthy are st- still a part of those that give testimony of Jesus Christ. Now the long, hot summer is going to prove them out whether they will be ripe, ready for the first resurrection at the end of the tribulation, or not. But they're going to be confronted with and have to have, according to the Word of God, endure in patience. Endure in patience, what's that mean? All of those things that are described as the commandments of Jesus Christ they must keep, which is... If you pick up a sword, you'll die by the sword. Yeah. You'll have to, you, 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 no liar will have a place. You'll have to own up. 
You'll have to confess. You can't take the seal. You can't fight. You can't enter into battle against him. It's the same as it was in the day of Jeremiah when Nebuchadnezzar was going to come and take the city. He, he, he was the only prophet that said, don't fight him. You, it's, it, it is in vain that you fight, and you fight against God. It's the same situation here for those that are left that didn't make the man-child, that weren't found worthy. Those are said they must endure in patience. Is just like those that didn't escape out of Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah who gave a warning for them to leave. And then they were led buck naked into Nebuchadnezzar's camp. Yeah, that's the way it's going to be for those that don't, that don't make the man-child that, that are left unworthy. They will have to endure to be found worthy. Where these have already been found to be worthy because they have overcome. So the woman, a woman having other children is now seen fleeing into the wilderness, which is prepared by God. He, he prepared a safe place for them, didn't he? He prepared a safe place for the man-child, and he prepared a safe place for those faithful on the earth to escape to. And then he promised to, to keep them and feed them. They're like Elijah and and others where Christ fed them. The sign ties the woman to the, both the heavenly and the earthly. I think this is important. The sign, this sign, this vision, ties the woman both to the heavenly realm through the man-child and to the earthly realm through the faithful that remain of her seed. And in, in the way that that works from Scripture, in Genesis 14, 19, Genesis 15, 5, and Genesis 22, 17, you'll see all examples to Abraham of how that God promised him both a seed that would be as abundant in, as the stars in heaven as the sands on the seashore. So he, what is represented to Abraham that his seed which is, in effect, this woman as well as the body of Christ would have a position both earthly and heavenly. And we see it here in the sign of the woman in that she has a presence both in the heavenly and in the earthly. And then Hebrews eleven twelve 12 is where it is said of Abraham who and Jacob that that they had no permanent home here, but their home was, their mind was on a heavenly home. Yes. No, no question. It's no question. This is the hour of Satan. This, uh, Christ referred to him, this is his hour. And well, his hour equates through this time frame to the end of the tribulation. He, this is his hour. And, 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 and the, the resisting of evil becomes on a personal level. It's, it's, not on a, it's not an outward, external level, but it's an internal level. On an internal level, the outward external is, I recognize Satan is in his hour. When I read the news, I recognize Satan is in his hour. My heart hurts. But I recognize that I, I'm not saying, God, you know, change this, do that. I know Satan has got his hour out here. What I'm focused on is, God, change this. I have an affinity for that. See, 
That's the dynamic we're working on right now. That, that is the, the staying power, the safety power, the, the, the help afforded to us by the Holy Spirit. So this woman is tied both to the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, and the sign of the, of the dragon ties both realms at once. As one now is pictured upon the earth and caught up to the heavenly realm, and the one in the heavenly realm is cast down onto the earth. What, what am I saying? I'm saying for your future reference, you should understand that God's kingdom is both heavenly and earthly. It's not just earthly. When you talk to people about the kingdom coming, they think you're talking about Christ coming and ruling from uh, Jerusalem over the earth through the uh, Jews. They haven't understood the heavenly portion of God's kingdom. And I'm trying to establish in Scripture here that you can see there is reality in believing there's a heavenly kingdom by showing you that the woman who represents the body of Christ has a heavenly as well as an earthly presence. Satan, as well as the earthly presence, has a heavenly presence. The battle is both earthly and heavenly. That's why I'm trying to reveal the kingdom of God coming has both in mind and view. If you just have one in mind, you'll be missing God's purposes. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which obey the commandments of God and have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are two entities. Here in this verse 17, we have an allusion to the two remaining seeds after the woman has given birth to the woman uh, to the man-child, who will be especially persecuted in the three and a half years remaining in the tribulation. All those that remain on the earth that are Christians or are Jews are in trouble. They're in a brew. They're in a terrible place. The true Israelite, Jew, who obeys the laws of Moses, and the Christian found unworthy for the catching up in the man-child who now have awakened to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's enough signs and events that happen that a lot of people, God forbid it be us, are awakened after this transaction. This transaction's in secret. This, this transaction happens in a moment when nobody's expecting it. The rest of this stuff, uh, it's, no, it's, it's going to be easy to document. Note, this does not take away. When I say there's two entities in allusion here in this verse 17 of two seeds, there, this is not to take away from another sense found in the verse that those who have the gospel also obey the commandments of Jesus Christ. But the, you, you've got to be able to see that, that there is an allusion here to those that keep the commandments of God and those that give the testimony of Jesus Christ. But that's not to say that those that give testimony of Jesus Christ don't keep the commandments of Jesus Christ, which would it exceed the commandments of God in, in moral and uh, every other type of action, thought, word, and deed. The woman's earthly seed of the nation of Israel flees being the guilty manslayer. This is, this is really the reality of what's being played out here in Leviticus, is that the man-child is caught up but the other seed, the seed, uh, the uh, little s, the Abrahamic seed, they are guilty of the blood of Yeshua. They're manslayers. They're not murderers, for the Lord said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. So they're not murderers, but they are manslayers. And the law of the manslayer is they must flee into a safety of one of those cities set about. For safety. Satan is the avenger of the blood. And he ch chases, legally chases, those that are fleeing to their place of safety because they are manslayers. And had God not 
divinely intervene by some supernatural act by swallowing up this that Satan sent after them who were going to the wilderness, they would have surely been killed. But having found this place of safety, the city of refuge, now they await by God to redeem them and forgive them for the new life of the high priest that comes about Melchizedek. So they flee away and they flee away to this appointed place for 1260 days, which is the same three and a half year period, which is now the last three and a half year period. There has been a three and a half year period leading up to these events where they flee. Now we find them fleeing in the 12th chapter of Revelation. What for? So then they might be purged by God. I love Isaiah 4, 4, 4. That to me speaks clearly to what God is doing with these. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughter of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And then Joel 3.21. The dragon pursues as the avenger of the blood but is thwarted by the supernatural act of God, he now turns to persecute the Jews in general and all of those who give testimony of Jesus Christ. Ooh, he now turns his focus. And now we see the setting up, the beginning of the Antichrist, ruling and reigning, the setting up of the system, the Antichrist system, which will be in in reality, we'll be focusing to kill or cull out anybody that doesn't worship the serpent, the Antichrist, through the false prophet. The woman of Revelation 12 in type answers to Sarah and her child of faith. The supernatural seed of promise to Abraham manifest Isaac. The antitype being the man-child being here birthed out of the woman or body of Christ. It's an allegory that, that was brought forth by Paul in Galatians that in chapter 4, I believe, that I'm alluding to there. It's just another way of God saying a few things, right? He has many ways of saying a few things. It, which adds credence and credibility, and, and, and it tells you you're on the right track. When you take the Old Covenant and you allow it to interpret these signs that God gave John in the New Covenant, we can get there with God's help, the Holy Spirit, and no ulterior motives or agendas. We can get there. God will reveal it. Then Revelation 12 also pictures Hagar and her son Ishmael in, in Galatians 4, which answers to the other seed born in the flesh of a bondwoman who Paul equated with religious Jerusalem in bondage to Sinai who was then cast out into the wilderness as is the antitype seed of the future, not to have any heavenly inheritance with a child of faith. I hope you can see, get a hold of that. I hope you can see that. I hope you can see that what has just been said there as it relates to what we've been talking about. They have no place here. They have a place. They have a place promised to them. But it's here on the earth and it's preeminent as dearly only the earthly kingdom. The promised seed, which is, which is typed in Isaac, was promised to Abraham, was supernatural birth to a son. That is, the inheritance is here in the heavenly realm. That is his seed, capital S, 
that we can be a part of. But we become like Ishmael when we, and Hagar, when we do not, when we do not take the, the battle to self. When we take not the battle to ourselves, then and we align, then we align ourselves with the law, and we align ourselves with Ishmael and Hagar, and Paul says that they have no part in the heavenly kingdom reign. They're exempted from, they're excluded from it. We, we should be able to see that that dynamic is what's playing out not only in the, in the earthly realm seed, but in the heavenly realm seed. Because God tied the two together through Isaac, through Hagar, and Ishmael, and Isaac. He tied the two together, the heavenly and the earthly. Having rejected the Messiah and consenting unto his death, has been rejected from the heavenly kingdom of Jesus Christ, Matthew 21, 43. In a sense, can be related here in Revelation 12 to Satan and his angels being cast out of any inheritance in the heavenly kingdom of Christ. Whoa. Okay. Maybe I take that too far. I don't think so. I think a scriptural example of what I'm talking about here is Satan and his angels lost that first heavenly realm. They were excluded and cast out of it. So was Hagar and Ishmael cast out of that same kingdom. The unfaithful living and those who die unfaithful before and during the tribulation are like unto those who are born again, child of God, but remain in the flesh. It's interesting. We're born of Isaac. We're to walk as Isaac. And though we're born as Isaac, if we do not remain in Isaac, if we do not fight the battle of Isaac, we become Ishmael. The flesh dominates, and the flesh is what... It, it excludes us from the heavenly kingdom. We are, even though we are sons, even though Ishmael is a son of Abraham, he is excluded from that kingdom. He is cast out. And have been rejected from the heavenly kingdom as the unwise virgins. Or as seen in the example of Esau, Hebrews 12. With Matthew 24, you can, you can look at the, Matthew 24, the last part of the 24, and see what I'm talking about. Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. You know what that is? That is a list of those things that exclude us from the kingdom. They exclude us from this right here. It's the same things that are listed in the first three chapters of Revelation. It's the leaven. It, we are in the process of unleavening. We should be. <clears throat> okay, so I stopped right there in, in my explanation or overview of the, the 12th chapter of, of Revelations, and then I start and just do a brief on 13th and 14th, because quite frankly, I know I'd run out of time. I'm sure, I don't even know what time it is now, but I'm probably already over. But I... I I knew that after going this far that I was going to have a difficult time <laughs> if I went in any great depth of 13th and 14th. But because I have included 12th, 13th, and 14th all together as a parenthetical interposed between the 11th and the 15th, I wanted to at least briefly say these three kind of have to do with telling us the different things, different events, and what, how Satan goes about, what he goes about, how he persecutes the church, who it is that he uses to persecute the church, and what happens, uh, we need to hear a little bit more in the 13th and the 14th chapter to fill that in completely. The 13th chapter says, after the flight of the seed of the woman into the wilderness, we have the rising up of the two wild beasts. That's afterwards. 
one of which was seen in chapter 11 as the slayer of the two witnesses. The earth is given up to Satan. And now we see how he will act against the remainder of the woman's seed. The, one, the earth is given over to Satan. Satan gives over his authority, gives his authority to the Antichrist. You wear that, right? All right, I can get kind of weird here. <clears throat> but if, 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 as I believe Scripture is related, and I believe we can literally take it, that the Antichrist comes out of the bottomless pit, which means he's out of the center of the earth. If you'll note, one of the beasts come up out of the earth, the other one comes out of the sea. The Antichrist comes out of the sea, I believe, and the false prophet comes out of the earth. Well, you've got to come out of one or the other if you're coming out of Hades. You, you've got to come out of one other. You're either going to come out of the water when you come out of the center of the earth, or you're going to come out, in, uh, out of the earth if you come from the center of the earth. Are you with me? Both those beings lived before and are now in Hades, and both will come from there. One come up through the sea, and I don't know what that means, but it's like Jonah. Jonah come up from the sea, right? Uh, and the other one comes up from the land. And there's another example in the Word of God for a prophet to come up out of the land. But I'm saying to you that, that the, the, this is the reality of those scriptures that when Satan is cast down to the earth, he's now no longer has a presence in heaven. His full presence is now on the earth that he brings and, and gives authority to the Antichrist who was in this place in the bottomless pit. Now, if I was in the bottomless pit, and I had presented to me a way that I could get out of the bottomless pit, I would probably take it. And that's, that's what's going to be offered by Satan, by God's permission. Why? Because he, he duplicates, or co uh, he, what's the word? He, he copies, he counterfeits. Everything God d d does, he is counterfeiting for his own kingdom. And so where there, he resurrected his son, he is now going to resurrect his son. And the false prophet is like unto John. So both of these beings have lived before. That's why they're cast, those two are cast directly into the lake of fire where they experienced the second death. They're resurrected. By the devil. Permissio from God in this hour of the devil. So we find that these two, two wild beasts are introduced to us in the chapter 13 in more detail. And we find that the, the first one, the Antichrist, the first one, sets up shop in Jerusalem. He sends out and persecutes, though. He sends out an army after those that have fled before him. The other one comes up, and he is the one that establishes the worship of the beast, the Antichrist. He establishes that. He is totally sold out to the beast or the Antichrist. He's the one that has two spirits that puts one spirit in the image and causes it to speak. That's the false prophet. That causes the men to worship the beast. You'll read about him starting there in the 13th chapter of Revelation. And then the 14th chapter of Revelation, we have the first fruits are taken from the tribes of Israel. Are not taken. I'm sorry. The, in the 14th chapter, we have the first fruits, but they're not taken from the tribes of Israel, but from men in general. Therefore, they are not the 144,000 of Revelation 7. That continues, they, that continue upon the earth. This is another 
representative 144,000. These are the first fruits of God and then and the Lamb. Having his Father's name written in their foreheads, they are caught up to heavens, or this heaven, first heaven. What am I speaking about? I'm talking to you about the man-child. This chapter 14 gives more detail about the man-child, which it now describes as the first fruits. At not, it doesn't describe it as the man-child. Now it describes it as the first fruits. This event, this catching up. And this is, a, a hundred. It's, it says to be 144,000. It, it, in my mind, it's a general term. It's, it's the same as the other 144,000 number. And because of that, I think it's just a general term of, a, of another amount. Maybe one in the forming. One that's being formed. So we have 144,000 represented from all of the tribes, the nations. It's not of the 12 tribes. It's a different 144,000. And it's called the first fruits offering. That's the man child, first fruits offering. They are the first fruits of God and the Lamb, they are, they are said. And they had the Father's name written in their foreheads. New covenant terms. New covenant terminology. This chapter shows the judgments upon those upon the earth. The severe judgments uh, in the second three and a half. The seventh trump with the last woe. The severe stuff begins. And now also the vials, the seven vials begin to be poured out. That's in the 15th chapter, but it's at this time right here. The harvest and the vintage answer to the wheat and the tares. That's the easiest way for me to get my arms around understanding this first fruits offering that Jesus uh, presents to the Father or in, in conjunction with himself and judges them and, and finds them worthy and they are called the first fruits of the the Lamb and of the Father of God. So the, the first fruits offering has this has this wheat and tares understanding. It is the harvest and the vin, uh, the vintage. Are you on pay five? Okay. The harvest and the vintage answer to the wheat and tares. The wheat. The, the, the first fruits answer to the wheat harvest. The first fruits of the wheat harvest are here. They're still the harvest that yet is future that's going to happen. You have the first fruits come in and they're offered unto God, and then later, when the rest of the, har the field, field, think about what Christ said in. Matthew chapter 13, about the tares and the field. In the field, they ripen. And along with them, the wheat, ripen the tares. So the tares are representative of what is the, called the vintage here in the 14th verse. And the, the wheat is the harvest. Are you with me? So, so you have, always you have the harvest, well, always you have the first fruits, then you have the harvest, then you have the vintage. And that's exactly the order that they're portrayed in the 14th chapter of Revelation. The vintage has to do with the treading out of the fierceness of God on the, on the tares. That's Matthew 13, 24 through 30. The harvest is the ingathering of His servants. Ingathering. The tabernacle. What comes after the harvest and, and the vintage? What comes after the harvest and vintage? Come on, all you the Hebraic roots people. It's tabernacles. <laughs> tabernacles now follows. And this is a terminology that's used in, in that period of time in the fall is the end gathering. So the end gathering is the harvest of the remainder of the faithful of God that have endured, have went through the tribulation. Not only them, though, those that were faithful in years and times past are now resurrected in the first resurrection. 
They join those faithful living at the end of the three and a half in the harvest. He fills with meaning a Leviticus 23, 10 through 13. And you all remember that from our studies in Leviticus. Jesus is both the priest and he is the he lamb. As the hundred, as you know, there was a presentation where the first fruits was a he lamb. He brought in the first fruits into the temple, but you also presented the he lamb. So he's both the priest and he's the he lamb. And the 144,000 are the first fruits offering. Uh, presented above in the first heaven where Jesus Christ having cast Satan out, he now keeps as his base of operations till he finally goes forth to battle upon the earth. When he goes forth to battle upon the earth is the harvest and the vintage. First the harvest, then the vintage. Catches up. Those that are living, those that are dead, that were found worthy, the remainder of the unworthy, the unwise virgins, they remain in Hades. The rest of the unjudged, ungodly, remain in the, the belly of the earth. They remain in Hades until the end of the millennium, until after that end of the millennium when we have the great white throne judgment, and then the rest of the dead are raised up to be judged. These, these, these first fruits are but a small part of the innumerable host that will join them at the end of the tribulation. Join them at the end of the tribulation. The first fruits are the man child. The first fruits are holy, so is the harvest. Isn't that the word of God? The first fruits are holy, so is the harvest. The harvest are those not ready in the early summer, but are ripened under the hot sun of summer. Those seed capital S and little s, those saved, remaining, are called now to endure. That is whom Satan concentrates now on, the serpent concentrates now on to persecute and kill because that he real recognizes that they would be a part of the harvest. And since they're earthbound, he has control over them. And it's his, it is his mindset to destroy them all. Every, he's going to put a seal on everybody. You don't have that seal, he's going to, he, you, you, he's going to kill you. you know, if you take the seal, you lose the inheritance. It's going to be a tough time. The first fruits are the man child. The first fruits are holy, so is the harvest. The rest of the harvest is coming, but it's going to be through the hot summer. These seed that are left that the devil is now trying to destroy are called now to endure. I'm talking about what, what's happening here in the 14th chapter. He calls them. Christ calls them in the last part of the 14th chapter, middle part of the 14th chapter. He says he calls this group that are remaining to endure. Here's the words. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that obey the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, both. Same parallel words to those remaining seeds as, is, as we found in 1217. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. From henceforth. Henceforth is after this, after this event, now there's, there's no other avenue of escape. Now it's only endure. You had your chance. Now he, said, he doesn't forsake them. He's saying, but endure. But you must endure according to the rules of engagement. Not making up your own rules. Not taking a sword up and killing them if somebody comes in your house. Not killing somebody who's trying to put a stamp on you. No, that, that's not the way it'll work. You have to endure. Blessed are those that are that blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. After the catching up of the man-child, and now faced with the Antichrist rage upon the earth, then the, the Spirit goes on to say, Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. 
And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. This is Christ that sits on the cloud. A loud voice comes out of heaven, out of the third heaven. Loud, that's why it was loud. Thrust in thy sickle. Actually, the Greek says, cast in thy sickle. Thrust means a closer proximity than the actual word cast. Cast goes more in line with the wheat and tares when he says to his angels, he sends his angels to reap the harvest. Remember? Are you with me? So uh, it's significant that you should understand thrust in thy sickle actually is cast in thy sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap. For the first fruit having been resented before Christ, now three and a half years later, the harvest is ripe. Now the harvest is ripe. Took three and a half years. Well, let's put it this way. It only took three and a half years. That, that's how long we know you have to endure. Revelations 14, 12 through 16. All these that endure or die in Jesus Christ, there's the option you endure and live, and then you have endure and you die in Jesus Christ, will have their part in the harvest. That is to say, the first resurrection from among the dead into the millennial kingdom of Christ. Matthew 20, 35. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Revelations 20, 4 through 6. Let's read Revelations 20, 4 through 6. I haven't read it for a month or two and out loud, so I, I want to read it because it's so poignant, so to the point. And, and I, this is John at the end of the tribulation said, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Where are those thrones? Right here. I will give you thrones. And, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which not, had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And then in, in the 14th chapter, in more toward the front, maybe toward the middle. The harvest, the, the first fruits is in the first part of chapter 14. The harvest is in the last part of chapter 14. And in the middle are these three angels with three different messages. And the first angel's message was to those in, caught in this sphere of the Antichrist in that time when when they must endure, to all men across the earth, the message goes forth. It, it's, it's, it's not the gospel, but it is a gospel. It, the gospel is fear God. But it, but it has been the declaration of holy men all, of all time. It's not our gospel, but it still is the declaration of all time of holy men. Fear God. This is the beginning of wisdom. The hour of judgment has come. There is but a very short time. Fear the creator of all and work. This is the angel going through the earth declaring this message. They, are, they, are, they feel hopeless. They feel trapped. They feel like they're, they're, they're going to be murdered or killed. This is a message that would supersede your fear of dying is this other fear. Fear God. Fear God. For if you fear God, he'll keep you. And if you die, you, it's better that you would fear man and rather than fear. Not fear God who has the ability to kill not only the flesh, but the soul. Fear God. This is the first angel's message. Fear the creator of all and worship him. Yeah, you missed the boat. Fear him. Worship him. Don't take the seal. And those that, don't, those that fear him, but not necessarily were those that 
uh, served him or were servants of him. There will be those that had lived through that tribulation period that feared him, that will be alive when he returns, and they will be a part of the sheep of Matthew 25 and a part of the fears of God. If you remember last week, I was telling you about the three categories of judgment. The fears of God, such as Cornelius is one, the, the Cyrenetian woman that, that you spoke of, she was another. There's lots of those are fears of God that are going to be judged, maybe not worthy of this or in this position as kings and priests and rulers, but they have a place because they feared God that equated to virtue, that equated to reward, a re recompense or reward, Revelations 11, 18. And then the second message is that that goes forth here in the 14th chapter is a precursor to what happens here in a few chapters. That's the destruction of Babylon. Babylon, that most equate with Rome. Her fornication is worldliness. She has mixed earthly carnal principles with heavenly ones. That's her sin. That's fornication. She is the mustard seed extraordinaire. Matthew 13, 13. She falls as the dragon and as his wild beasts burn her. She is no longer additive to his now cast out position. You know, when he was the serpent, see, when he was a serpent, that, re that represents stealthiness. As a serpent, he deceived Eve. But now as a red dragon, it's in your face, all full on murder you, kill you. No stealth involved. When he needed stealth, he needed a representative that would mix godliness with worldliness. The religions of the earth and the world with God's worst, true worship. He needed an instrument in the earth to convey that. Thus, that's where he had the birth of the religious leaven, the mustard seed that grew unnaturally. So here she is, extraordinaire. The wild beasts don't need her anymore. They kill her. She is no longer additive to his now cast out position. While he's stealth as a serpent, she served his purpose as well in deceiving the nations in the time of mystery. But now, it's no longer mystery. It's in being unfolded. The mystery of the kingdom of God is being unfolded. But now he is the dragon cast down to earth to force men to sin. Force them. You will take this seal. You will worship me. In this, she stands in his way and is destroyed. You can see how she would stand in his way from, from that sort of edict. Then the third... She is relig religious. And then the third angelic message was the vintage. The vintage is the destruction of those that are anti-Christ who have then ignored the angel and worshiped the wild beast and his statue and who have taken his mark. The woman's seed furnishes the harvest and the dragon's seed furnishes the vintage. After the harvest and the vintage comes the joy-filled Feast of Tabernacles, which answers to the millennial age of 1,000 years. It is booths. It's not eternal. This is, this is tabernacling. That's what I was talking to you about, the temple, the temple coming here. As the tabernacle of Moses went with the altar and the tabernacle, the altar comes here. Imagine the altar and the tabernacle, this becomes the booths, the place of the booths the place where they tabernacle, in the heavenly place, representative of Moses' tabernacle and tabernacling. Are you with me on that? So it is, it is temporal, though. As I said, it's awaiting a, they're awaiting a permanent home. That, that Hebrews chapter 12 relates to, to Abraham and Jacob and us. We're to look for an eternal home, right? One that comes down from heaven, the new Jerusalem. That's eternal. This, all of the rest of this is temporal. Amen? Thank you. Thank you for your, once again, your time and your patience. Thank you for attending. I know it takes an effort. In my mind, and this is not a sales pitch, you haven't heard me say this, but in my mind, this, this is, is what, what God re refers to as uh, redeeming the time, for it is short, and it is, it is the means 
unto victory. It is the meditation around the words of God. It's a synergism. It's one can put a thousand, two can put ten thousand. It is in the last days, don't forsake the assembling together. All of these things that you are doing here today are scriptural, godly, and have a purpose and have a fruit and have reward. Your diligence, your discipline in coming and applying and listening every week is, is noted. I one time had a man come by my little cubicle where I had been nose down and rear end up for years. And he said to me in my ear, he says, don't think that all your hard effort and work is going unnoticed. I had been doing what I was doing for a long, long time. Tedious, tiresome, meaningless, uh, uh, menial. (laughs) But yet, that word stuck with me and it encouraged me greatly. It encouraged me greatly. I mean, I worked even harder at that task. That's what I would extend to you today. Your efforts of discipline in what seems to be a menial task to many of attending here to hear the word of God preach to you. Believe me, I'm putting effort into being up here talking. I'm not just coming and extemporaneously speaking to you whatever comes off the top of my head. I'm seeking God and looking to God. That's all I can offer you. That's all I can. But I am doing that. So I, I would like to say to you that I appreciate it. Your, your hard work is not going unnoticed to me. And when I, quote, when I go to pray for this group, guess whose faces come first to me? Guess whose faces first come to me? The ones I've been staring at every Saturday. Yeah. I can tell you quite honestly, generally the first person that comes to my mind when I pray for this group, can you guess who? Curtis. He's been the most disciplined, faithful servant that I could ever have. And when I pray, I pray for that man all the time because of his faithfulness. He doesn't get anything. He doesn't receive anything. Earthly, he just does. And he does it with a good attitude, joy, every week. I'm telling you, I believe that it, that it is not going unnoticed. His hard work is not unnoticed in me, and it's not unnoticed by God, the Spirit of God. And, and whatever that equates to, I don't know, but I'm telling you, discipline and faithfulness, in, and especially in the things that are not easy, I mean, these are hard to put into practice. It's hard to, hard to bear sometimes. They're, they cut. Uh, that's okay, though. Those of you who have learned to live with, with uh, chastenings, it's good, isn't it? How else we want to sit? You want to be spoke to and soothed like the devil, and just you're fine. Everything's good. You're nothing wrong with you. You're going to make it. You're lovely. You're better than everybody else, or better as most. Or you want to listen to that stuff, or you want to listen to the Spirit of God, the exhortations of Christ. He didn't pull any punches. He told them, "This is what you're doing wrong. This is what you're doing right. Shore up the things that are right. Work on the things that are wrong, or else I will take away your candle." Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, two things. First one short. Uh, you know, it says pray that you be counted worthy to escape all these things. It sounds like, oh, Lord, please, I pray that I'm worthy. Well, but praying that you're worthy is actually inviting, pruning, and chastening, and refining, and all that. That's like, I don't know, I just saw that verse differently. But the other thing was like, when you're talking about the seal, God's people being sealed, um, the 144,000. It reminded me of uh, Ezekiel 9, where it talks about the man dressed in linen, uh, marking the foreheads of the righteous in Jerusalem with an ink horn before killing all the others who worship false gods, or who did not grieve and weep for the sins of the people. And with the scanners and all this stuff, you know, it's like, um, you know, judgment's coming on America, I just truly believe. But Ezekiel 14, 14 says, though these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job were in it, they should deliver only their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord. Which reminded me of Enoch, being having the righteousness of Enoch and, and Elijah. It's like having that righteousness, either hopefully you can get raptured, or hopefully you'll, God will keep you in the midst of all the judgment that's coming upon. You know, either way, God protects you from His judgments. If you don't make the rapture, He'll protect you from His judgment. He'll feed you, but you might die from the Antichrist. That's right. He doesn't forsake you. He just now changes the command 
from a mercy and grace kind of message of you should prepare before this gets here to I didn't prepare, now it's I will keep you, but you'll have to endure. And, I, and that... That's right. That's right. That we're like, this is like unto Enoch right here. This is like unto Enoch. Though Job is like unto those that were had to go through the summer. They had to go, he had to go through to get to that place where he was refined. He, he was already a, a righteous man. But when he got finished, when God got finished with him, because he yielded to it, right? Though the Lord slay me, you know, his attitude was uh, one of yieldedness. Yes, and he had a great reward, twofold. Praise the Lord.